So what what I wanted to talk about um, is uh, is that there is a lot of knowledge in this room, and I want to first up up front, even though I've been a practitioner for like a decade or or a little longer, I remember my hair wasn't this gray when I started. That's all I ever remember. That's my sort of marker. Um, there's an incredible amount of knowledge in this room, and then there's so much more beyond the boundaries here. So I'm actually most excited to hear what all of you. Uh, think in the discussion to follow. But uh, what I wanted to start with was my own story of how I ended up as a practitioner. So I was uh, a scientist for a while, and I ended up starting my own science company and sold it. And I was in this position where I could uh, really have a midlife crisis a couple decades too early about what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, and so naturally, I went to a science conference, which is a terrible idea. That's not where you like sort of figure out your life, but that's where I was. And I saw a flyer up on the wall that said, uh, come to a science cafe. And it was like at this bar that was two blocks from my apartment. And I thought they had themed out my local bar in like a science kind of motif. And I was like, I'm down with that. And so I went. And of course, like a science cafe isn't that. It was like a scientist, like having a dialogue and actually talking to people. And I remember that night because I ended up staying for like four hours. And I just remember the people there that night, how generous they were. They would talk to me. And I just felt like I was taken back to the days when I really fell in love with science. We were just talking about it and sharing, it, sharing conversation over beers. It was wonderful. Uh, well, then a month later, I had started a science cafe myself. Uh, and I started doing that as a hobby on the side. And a, about a year later, uh, my science cafe had moved to a nightclub in San Francisco, uh, because that's what happens, I guess. Um, so we're in a nightclub on a Thursday night. Just FYI, a nightclub with the lights on, not the prettiest picture. But anyways, it was big enough, and I, we were doing an event on meditation, and which always felt like a little bit of a leap for me um, from a science perspective. Uh, but we had a researcher from Stanford talking about his experience like doing studies on, on mindfulness and the impact on anxiety. And I remember we were having in like the dialogue portion of the night, and I came up to uh, a woman in the back, and she started shaking before I handed her the microphone. And she started bawling as soon as I handed it over to her. And it was one of those moments where like the oxygen leaves the room and there's like 400 people here that night and everything goes deathly quiet. And she just starts talking about how her life has been incredibly painful and how she's contemplated suicide for so long and lost her partner to suicide and how mindfulness was one of the only ways that she felt relief from that. And what happened next like, changed my career, because I just remember the scientist listening to her. He didn't offer her any solutions. He just treated her like, in the most human way possible, like acknowledge that pain, acknowledge the places that his knowledge didn't answer the question she wanted. Uh, and how much that meant to her was everything. Like, that, that was the night a hobby turned into a profession for me. Uh, and from there, I started doing all the things that uh, somebody that wants to do this as their career starts doing. I started organizing people. I started asking questions. And, and a few year, uh, another year later, I ended up helping launch a science festival and a movement. And it turned into a whole career for me. Let's pause there for a second. Let's rewind this story which is deeply meaningful to me, and look at it in a different way. Let's look at it through the lens of privilege that I just shared with you. I'm a guy that just sold a business, so I had some money. Uh, I had some free time. And so then I went to a science conference. <laughs> and then I ended up at an event two blocks from my house and then I ran a series of events for free for a number of years before I lucked into a job that doesn't exist in terms of starting a science festival. How reproducible is that? 
I bring that up because I think it's important to look at this through that lens. Uh, it's that so much of public engagement with science is a hobby now, if we are to really take a hard look at, at it. And hobbies are great. Hobbies are fulfilling. Hobbies are like, if you ask me what I really want to do, I actually want to go work on my hobby right now. But hobbies don't pay. They actually require money to be put in. Uh, hobbies don't lead to long-term results because there's no coordination. And so I ask all of you, is public engagement with science a profession or is it a hobby? I actually kind of want answers to this. Um, so let's delve into that just a little bit more. And I, I want to emphasize this with, with one other piece that um, our founder at, at, at CZI says. Um, I've been very lucky. And through that story, I think I kind of emphasize the places I got lucky. And you can only be lucky so many times before you say, uh, is luck really what's at play, or is the system just broken? And so when I think about what's wrong structurally with this, let's talk about public engagement with science as a profession. How do we hire people to do public engagement with science? So I worked at the University of California, San Francisco for the last 10 years before going to CZI. And every science communication position or science engagement position we advertised in that 10 years that I ever saw included one line that said PhD preferred or PhD required. And uh, it took me like seven years to be like, why is that on there? What does that do? It's been a while. Maybe recent grad students can tell me, is there like some sort of public engagement certification that's happening in PhDs right now? I don't think so. And so I call out first and foremost, we are using public engagement with science to solve a problem in science, that, P that we're generating PhDs without fully formed career paths for them. And I think a lot of universities are using PES as a solution for that, as opposed to what public engagement with science needs. So I would call that out as the first structure. Um, and then it, to go beyond that, this isn't just the hiring practices. This is about what's the next step of any profession. You have professional meetings. You have a network of sharing of resources. Some of that's at play. But is it really at play? Do we do all of those things? Do we embody research and translate it into practice? Do people identify as being public engagement practitioners? I barely do. I've been doing this for 10 years. Like, I feel like this is the crux of a, of a huge issue, is if we do not identify that personally, then how is this going to persist? All right, I'm going to go uh, a different direction. I just have one other soapbox before I talk about the other second model. I, I just want to react to one thing that I think Angela framed so perfectly uh, about agency. All of those arguments that occur about why we should do this occur to me as moral arguments. Like that we need to do, that uh, we need to embody inclusive practices, we need to uh, diversify the people doing this because that's the right thing to do. I don't know about any of you, I feel like the, I've been asking people to do the right thing for the past few years of my life and that hasn't worked out so well in a lot of capacities. The right thing to do doesn't get things done. And I really openly wonder, what is the economic model? What is the business model for this work? That's what a professional field has underneath it, a reason for existence that has incentive structures that push it forward. So what is it for this field? And who gets to define that? I think is a huge structural challenge that underpins all of this, because until we do it, we can't expect this to turn from a hobby to a profession. All right, I'm going to go a totally different direction with my last structural issue. Uh, there's so many structural issues to choose from that this was hard to center down to. But my other one that I want to pick out as the one of the most nascent and hard to get away from structures in PES is the lecture. I want to destroy the lecture. 
<laughs> and I'll, I'll take it from this perspective. Back in 2007, I started a calendar of all the science events happening in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, which is one of the more kind of like dense areas where public science events happen. Uh, and since then, we've cataloged, I think, just under 15,000 total events in the last 10 years uh, that were publicly uh, accessible. We don't think that's all of them, that's, but it's probably in that kind of like 80, 90% category. Of those, I looked at how many included a lecture component to them. <coughs> Any guesses? Wait, wait, say the numbers a little louder. 90%. 90%, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it ended up being 78%. Um, we know from work in education that what we're looking at is developing a sense of, if you subscribe to what Angela said, that we're looking at agency. Who's left a lecture felt a sense of agency? <laughs> Repeated over time. It is the default structure that we use to communicate our work. And for those that might work in media, don't think your article is not just a lecture in a different form. <laughs> so I really want to tease apart if the structures that we put out there, we may profess to be public engagement with science, but if the structures we're actually employing just perpetuate the problems, are we really engaging people with science? And are we just elevating the stories of where it's working to hide the fact that we're not doing it at scale? Thank you. <laughs>